The Law Enforcement Committees, we're pleased to be here today. We have three presentations for you. Our first presentation is enhancing school safety using a threat assessment model. Now, ensuring uh, the safety of our schools uh, involves multiple components, physical security, emergency management, but it should also include prevention efforts uh, in the form of a threat assessment process. This process begins with establishing a targeted violence prevention plan. Law enforcement training officer Micah Stoll from the AG's office will present. We've been working on this project for about nine months. Uh, uh, about six individuals at the AG's office, Micah, myself, as well as uh, Holly Hollingsworth, who is our director of communications. Holly, I'd like to just, uh, she's been an integral part uh, to this project. And um, so our project involves creating a training video for school resource officers as well as school officials uh, on how to establish threat assessment uh, capabilities within K through 12 schools as well as higher ed. Our training video consists of 11 components and provides basic instructions for schools on creating a targeted violence prevention plan. The focus of which is to decrease the risk of students engaging in harm to themselves or the school community. So our training video lines up with recommendation number 28 uh, found in the prevention sector of the advisory council report. Uh, that recommendation states to recognize and strengthen the prevention role of law enforcement in schools. So as we're kind of talking about a threat assessment team, what we're looking at is, is that idea of about five to nine people. And we're gonna talk about it here in the next slide, but a multidisciplinary team. So what that means is, is not just law enforcement, um, not just school personnel, but a combination of all of them. The idea of uh, school personnel, um, uh, teachers, administrators, uh, local law enforcement, uh, mental health professionals, everybody kind of working together. And, and one of the things is we're kind of looking at that definition here that we kind of talk about. There's, there's a couple things in particular uh, where it says the second to last line concerning behaviors. So when we talk a lot about the Secret Service, uh, their models and their ideas and, and what they bring to it, they really kind of talk about those concerning behaviors. So what is the, the student exhibiting? What are they saying? What are they doing? What does their schoolwork indicate that maybe kind of shows that, that there's maybe something going on with this kid? Uh, something, some issues that we maybe need to look at or the team should kind of dive into. When we start looking at the very last line, threat and violence, that's where Dr. Cornell comes in. When he talks about in his threat assessment guidelines, he talks a lot about threats. So what we talked, what we wanted to kind of do was, was kind of combine those two, combine concerning behaviors, combine threats of violence, and kind of give a, a, a full scope of, of what's going on with the kid. Um, so to do that, we brought in a lot of people, which you kind of saw. Um, you know, Dr. Cornell was, was the first uh, person who spoke. Uh, I always kind of bring it up, I was talking about it even this weekend with my fiance that like, Dr. Cornell was maybe the most impressive person like I've ever heard speak. Uh, you can go on YouTube uh, and, and look at, he's, he's testifi testified in front of Congress, he's done all sorts of stuff. Uh, halfway through him talking, I remember thinking like, what the hell am I going to say that, that this guy already hasn't said? Like why, you know, what should I, why should I be doing this? This guy like really covers everything. And he talks not just about violence and school violence, but he talks a lot about uh, violence with firearms and stuff as well. So Cornell was, was great. Uh, Lena Alathari was uh, with the Secret Service and the head of the National Threat Assessment Center. She spoke at the law enforcement conference this year. Uh, again, really great resource. Mark was able to reach out to her. She agreed to be part of the training video and, was, and brings a lot of credibility when you have like the Secret Service, the people who do, like the head of threat assessments is talking about threat assessments in our training. And then we brought in tons of other people. We saw Dave Yost, the AG, uh, speak. We brought in an attorney to kind of talk about HIPAA and FERPA and talk about the legal aspects of what we're going to be doing. We brought in uh, individuals from the Ohio Department of Education to talk about safe school climates, about physical health, about mental health. Um, we brought in uh, uh, superintendents, law enforcement, school resource officers. We brought in all types of people. And the whole point of this is originally, or initially this is gonna go out to SROs um, and, and anybody else who's working in school. But we made it specifically, and you saw in that introduction, if, even if you've never been a cop, even if your extent of your copping is, is watching Law and & Order, you can watch this video and, get in, and, and understand what a threat assessment team. So we made it specifically for like a threat assessment team, not specifically for law enforcement. So 
as kind of mentioned in the video, this is our initial document, and this is kind of what is our guidelines, everything that drives home what we're trying to do. Uh, the, we have 11 parts of our training video. These eight are the main ones. We have an introduction, uh, conclusion, and then we also have something about vulnerability assessments. But this is really the most important aspect of it. And, and, and it's the whole idea of, of this kind of sets the framework for everything that we're doing. So I thought I'd just talk really briefly um, about each one. So the first one, again, is about putting together a multidisciplinary team. Again, school personnel, law enforcement, mental health professionals, everybody that, that can kind of bring in information about this kid, about the student, so that we can kind of get a full picture of what's going on in their life. The second one is defining concerning behaviors. Now that's going to kind of be up to each individual team. Because a concerning behavior maybe in a, uh, in a more urban school would be different than a concerning behavior in a rural school. Uh, you know, it could be different depending on the age of, of, the, of the kids that make, the, that make some sort of threat or exhibit concerning behavior. So, so defining concerning behaviors is really going to have to be individualized. And that's a really key component to everything that we're doing with this team is that it has to be individualized to that student, to that incident, and what's going on. Third, create a central reporting system. So we mentioned House Bill 123 is what set the groundwork for, uh, for this threat assessment team. It also says that there has to be a central reporting mechanism that's a 24-7 manned uh, location that, uh, that can, people can send texts in, emails, uh, phone calls, or whatever to kind of report to any sort of anything that might happen. Um, there's a, a program in Colorado that's kind of the model program that everybody uses, um, and I think it's kind of being going to be kind of uh, modeled here in, in, in Ohio as well. Uh, it's going to be headed up by DPS, also in conjunction with Ohio Department of Education. We won't have a whole lot, as far as the AG's office and, and this training, won't have a whole lot about the central reporting, reporting mechanism other than talking about what it is and how it's going to kind of be used. Fourth, determine law enforcement intervention. So this might sound weird for a law enforcement agency to say, but we want to have as little intervention as possible. Ideally, we don't want to get involved, right? Because once we start getting involved, now it starts a, a whole other aspect that hopefully we're trying to avoid. The whole goal is, is we don't want police involved. We want them to get the help that they need, they do well in school, and law enforcement stays out of it. So as little of law enforcement intervention as possible. I know a lot of times you see kind of a lot of people like in law enforcement uh, try to act or at least think that they're kind of like the alpha and they try to take over situations. Um, that's one thing we want to avoid with this threat assessment team. Uh, it really should be headed up by the superintendent or designee of the superintendent and not by in law enforcement. Again, they should kind of be on the, uh, in the, kind of in the, the background and, and there as needed. Uh, fifth, assessment procedures. We're going to talk a little bit about this uh, further on. That's where Dewey Cornell kind of comes in. The uh, Secret Service doesn't talk a lot about the assessment procedures. It just kind of talks about some themes that the assessment procedures should look at uh, and kind of leaves each team to develop their own. Six, risk management options. Um, it's really a, probably the smallest part of our training, primarily because of the model that Cornell developed. Uh, there, there doesn't need to be any sort of risk management options. Uh, the model, once we look at it, you'll understand what, uh, why that's not needed. Uh, seven, create and promote safe school climates. Again, that's where we brought in ODE. Uh, it's something that at the AG's office, you know, people who are like, you know, Secret Service and law enforcement, uh, uh, we, we don't have that expertise. So we brought people in from, uh, from ODE to really kind of talk about that and what they're currently doing. And then the last one, conduct training for all stakeholders. And again, we'll kind of hit on that at the very end. But the biggest thing is that anybody who's part of the threat assessment team, as per law, has to take, at le has to take a threat assessment training and then re-up every three years thereafter. Um, and then the good thing is that we're going to be providing this training for free. So anybody who wants to be a part of a threat assessment team uh, will be able to take the training for free, be able to do it on their own time, won't have to miss work, school, anything like that. So part of, uh, uh, part of uh, step five of the Secret Service is the assessment uh, procedures. So like I said, they didn't uh, give what an assessment should look like. And again, that's what Dr. Cornell is going to be showing here or we're, we're going to talk about in a little bit. But what they do talk about in uh, the Secret Service is these key themes. These 13 themes are what we're kind of looking at. And as we go through our training, we, don't, uh, we not only kind of talk about, some, uh, about each one, but in some of them we also kind of give some kind of case studies, just a real brief one, just real you know, quick examples of, of things that have happened in real life and where, these kind of, where it kind of played in these th uh, 13 themes. So, so again, we're kind of looking at the students' uh, motives and goals. You know, that's pretty obvious. Uh, that's the kind of the main thing, the main goal of the whole uh, uh, team. The concerning unusual and threatening communications, uh, again, 
when we're talking about uh, concerning behaviors, that's just such a, a wide range of things. We're not talking about just the way that they act, but we're talking about maybe some, uh, some things that they're, you know, changes in personality, changes in schoolwork, maybe things that they've written online, uh, um, maybe you know, all, all aspects of it. So when we're talking about concerning behaviors, you know, we're talking about such a wide range of things going on with students. Inappropriate interests. Again, that's uh, such a big thing when you start hearing kind of the afterwards of, of uh, after an incident takes place. You're starting to hear a lot of times about all sorts of uh, inappropriate interests that, that students had, primarily with violence. We see a lot of uh, you know, uh, inappropriate interests towards uh, other uh, shooters, especially school shooters. Um, fourth, access to weapons. Again, uh, I forget the, the exact numbers. It's, it's in our presentation. But in a majority of them, uh, the guns that were used were uh, taken from home. So what we're talking about is, is, is easily uh, accessible weapons that students are able to find. But we also want to talk about weapons isn't just guns. We're starting to see more and more other weapons used um, uh, in El Paso, right after Parkland, down in El Paso, Texas, uh, homemade explosives, uh, homemade IEDs uh, were used. Um, we saw here in, at Ohio State a uh, vehicle and an edge weapon was used. So we're starting to see all sorts of different type of weapons used. We just not, I know we focus on guns because they can most of the time the most amount of damage the quickest, but we do need to access on, or, uh, pay attention to all weapons. Uh, stressful events that take place in, in the students' lives. Uh, again, we give a little case study about that, about um, uh, just incidents that took place in a kid's life, didn't have the coping mechanisms to, to deal with it, and eventually kind of um, acted out in a way that was inappropriate. And luckily, they were able to kind of catch it before he actually was able to cause damage at his school. The impact of emotional and developmental issues, again, that's the whole part of this, this whole group getting together, is, is how are we able to kind of reach these students and kind of work with them uh, and, and get them the help they need. Uh, evidence of desperation, hopelessness, or suicide. There was a really good case study with that one where a kid was uh, being picked on uh, for, for um, they're giving him like uh, homophobic and, and racial taunts. They ended up killing uh, uh, the kind of the main bully. And afterwards he said he just felt he had no other choice. He was either gonna die or that other kid was gonna die. And it kind of showed that kind of hopelessness and desperation that that kid uh, had. Uh, went to the school several times and, and, and felt like he wasn't getting the help and, and kind of acted out in that way. Uh, number eight, where, whether the students uh, view violence as an option to solve problems. Again, I think that's a really big part of what Cornell talks about is, uh, is that inability to, to cope with things, and, and that's their way of kind of, of showing it. So when they actually make those threats um, and, and show that that's the way that they deal with, with issues, you know, that's where they kind of need to step in. Whether others are concerned about the student statements, capacity to carry out the attack, which kind of goes to number four of the weapons, evidence for, of planning for an attack, um, that's a really big one. You know, the biggest one that you can really find a lot of information out is Columbine, where you can see that they actually drew like maps of like the cafeteria. They kept head counts of who, uh, of how many students were in there at, at the at what time, so they can kind of have the have the most damage. Um, there was a, a whole lot of that. Uh, same thing that went through with Virginia Tech. Uh, you saw it with with uh, tons of others um, where where there's maps and and numbers and and times and all that type of stuff that they want to cause the most damage. Um, if they're going to actually do this. Uh, Twelve, consistency between the student statements and actions. We're going to talk about transient and substantive threats here in a second. And when you start seeing a consistency between what they're actually doing and what they're saying, that's where we need to really kind of pay that most attention. That shows that that student is really serious about, about causing whatever damage they're thinking about doing. And then positive or pro-social influences and events. You know, that idea, does that, does that kid have, have teachers or students or somebody in their lives, family, that they can kind of reach out to that's a, a, a positive influence on them? And what we're finding is, is many don't. And again, there, again, in a case study, we look at a kid who made a lot of threats on, uh, or not a lot, made a threat on TikTok, the app. And uh, when he was uh, apprehended, he kind of just said he had, he had no other way of expressing himself. And, 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 and that was the only thing that he could do. So we're looking at that Secret Service Guide. So again, we pulled a lot of resources together, and, and that Secret Service Guide set a really good, uh, a really good kind of guidelines for what we're trying to do. But the biggest thing that it was missing was that, that assessment procedures, that step five. And that's where Cornell came in. And like I said, Cornell to me was, again, the, one of the most impressive people I've ever heard speak. He's been very great, uh, very generous with, uh, with everything. And, and, um, and he allowed us to use not only his uh, guidelines, his, uh, but also the paperwork that goes along with it. Um, he has uh, uh, for free uh, and all that stuff. That, so 
as you're starting to do these threat assessment uh, um, threat assessments for schools, there's paperwork that goes along with it that kind of talks about interviewing students, about uh, mental health uh, evaluation, all this stuff. And, and all of that is going to be available to anybody on the threat assessment team for free. So these are the kind of the, the, the main thing, the, the decision tree that we're going to be looking at. And I know it's really kind of small writing, uh, but the main thing is that we're at kind of the step one you know, through five. So Cornell mentioned in 2001 he started this. They, it was originally called the Virginia uh, School Threat Assessment Guidelines. It was a seven-step process. It's since been condensed and, and changed to the Comprehensive School Threat Assessment Guidelines. And the whole thing is, is they're trying to determine if a threat is transient, which means it's not really a threat, or is it substantive? And yeah, we need to really kind of deal with it. So the step first one is evaluating the threat and determining if it's a threat at all. So, you know, we've all heard the story of like the kids on the playground playing. They kind of point their fingers like their guns shooting at each other or doing whatever. You know, and, and a lot of times that overreaction of, of dealing with the kids. I mean, in the end, most of the time, it's not a threat. It's kids playing, right? So you can maybe talk about, hey, that's not appropriate. We don't do that at school. But, you know, it, it, it kind of meets that first one. It's transient, not in, or not even transient. It's not even a threat at all. And then the second one, uh, attempt to resolve the, the threat as transient. Um, you know, think of something like, you know, kids are in an argument. One of them says, you know, I'm going to kill you. Well, I, you know, it, it's one of those things that people say. Um, you know, doesn't mean that there's not going to be repercussions. Doesn't mean that the kid can't have some sort of suspension or, or in-school suspension. Doesn't mean that they can't get referred to, to any sort of mental health treatment. But most likely, they're not really, they're not intending to kill them. It's just something that's, that's being said. So the biggest part so, is, is three through five, that responding to a substantive threat. Uh, so if we've moved to step three, then you're going to automatically move to four and five. So the whole thing is if we move to three is we've determined that that threat is serious. So a lot of times, like we talked about earlier, if the student's actions and their comments kind of mirror up together, then we're moving to that step three that the, it's a substantive threat. And if it's a substantive threat, then we need to do a step four, conduct a safety evaluation. And, and that means we're definitely getting some sort of mental health treatment. And that's where if law enforcement is going to intervene, it's probably going to be there in step four. So that's where somebody's made like a very serious threat, has brought a weapon to school, has posted something online uh, saying what they're going to do. So in that step four is where law enforcement is going to probably get involved. And then step five, that implement and monitor a safety plan. So once we kind of, re you know, if, 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 if I made a threat, you know, we, we, they intervene, they stop it, they do all that stuff. At that point, you can't just end it, right? Now you've got to have to, some sort of safety plan, not only for the student, but for the whole school. And, and that's the, one of the most important parts is, is implementing and monitoring that safety plan. So one of the things that as we talk about this decision tree and this assessment process, one thing to really kind of think about is, is sometimes schools think of it as a kind of uh, maybe a cumbersome process, something that, that will cause more work for them to do. But really the whole goal of this is to make things easier, is to give them a step-by-step -step process, the paperwork to follow, so that if they want to, uh, they can use this and, and really kind of have a, a systematic process that they'll be able to use every time that there's some sort of threat done. And the whole other thing that we're trying to say is, is that this is uh, use a kind of whole community approach. Is, is Understand that the kid has a life outside of school, that they have family, that they have friends, that they have clubs, activities, all these other things. So if they are making threats, it's great to talk to teachers and classmates and maybe the, you know, the football coach or whatever, but realize that there's all these other things outside of their lives that, that's going on that, that's affecting what they're doing. So when we take all those three things, when we take those 13 themes that we talked about, we take that decision tree, we take that community approach of looking at a problem, then we're hitting that whole 360 degree threat assessment picture. And that's kind of the whole goal of this training, is, is to take everything that's going on in that kid's life and looking at it so that we can kind of make whatever decision is best to kind of to help the kid out. So real quick, the, 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 the other thing that, that's really kind of important that we're going to hit on is also making sure that we're conducting training. All right, so we talked about how you have to take a training to be a part of the team, how you have to do it every three years thereafter, but also making sure that, that you know, the team is training regularly on their own. Max uh, talks about, I don't, I don't remember where we're going to use it or if we are using it in one of the clips or uh, one of the, the sections, how the uh, Stoneman had a, a threat assessment process and that the Nicholas Cruz, the, the kid who did the shooting, actually went through it. And they're just, the principal who did the threat assessment hadn't done one in like 30 years. It, just, it was just, they didn't practice. So all of a sudden something serious happened and they just did not know what to do with it. So it's really important to kind of stay up on it. So even if it's not happening on a regular basis at your school, 
that you're still maybe you know, looking at what's happening on, at other schools and other jurisdictions and really kind of running through and, and maybe kind of doing some training and say, all right, if this happened here, how would we do it? How would we go about kind of working through it and, and trying to kind of figure this process out?